David Giori. Thank you. So I will go on stage here and imagine if I go off stage immediately, but jokes aside, we will talk about something very, very beautiful today. We will talk about advanced digital banking strategies. Can you hear me in the back? Can you hear me in the front? Yeah. Very good news. I am training bankers like you all around the world. I have been working with bankers in over 60 countries. I am co-author of five books, and I am a speaker as well as an advisor. Here are the five books I am co-author of. The AI book, Artificial Intelligence in Banking. The Paytech book, The Future of Payments. The FinTech book, Translate into 12 languages. The Wealth Tech book about the future of wealth management, Paolo talked about it. And another Wealth Tech book published in Switzerland about providing wealth management products and services to millennials and the Generation Z. Today, we will cover 41 slides. So we will move fast and we will talk about very exciting topics. Gordon Moore and Robert Metcalf. Metcalf's law, uh, the purple line, is about the value of digital ecosystems. For example, peer-to-peer -peer money transfer, chat, social media, being exponentially proportionate to the number of active users, not only linearly, but exponentially. That's very important for us. The more people who are using a given digital service, the more value it provides for every additional user. We also know it as the network effect. The blue line is about Moore's law. You can see Gordon Moore there, one of the founders of Intel. And in 1974, Gordon Moore gave a very famous interview where he explained that the cost of computing everything unchanged, the transfer of data, storage of data, computational power, uh, is going 50% down US dollar nominal terms year on year everything unchanged. Think about buying a pen drive with 128 gigabytes storage and the price of the same pen drive one year down the road. When these two charts cross each other, we are creating a very aggressive, exponentially growing delta of digital disruption. And this delta of digital disruption is what we bankers are all facing today. This delta of digital disruption is making ICT, information communications technology, rise as a GPT, general purpose technology. General purpose technologies are very rare. For example, writing was a general purpose technology. We still write uh, around 3500 BC. In fact, in some banks, in fact, in many banks, some clients are still writing some handwritten product application documents, for example. Imagine processing those. Anyway. Printing, 1500 AD, even though writing and printing are intertwined, interrelated, there is a humble 5,000 year gap between the two technologies. Do we write in all industries? Of course we do. Steam engines, 1790 AD, were there social movements uh, trying to break these machines, trying to slow disruption down? Yes. Were they doomed to fail? Yes. You cannot stop general purpose technologies. You can learn them, you can embrace them, 
and you can win them. And that's why we are here. This conference, this forum, this retreat is exactly about this. Electricity, 1890. Do we use electricity in basically all daily activities across all industries around us? Of course we do. And then around 1990, the general purpose technology of our time, ICT, information communications technology. Why did I put this date, 1990? Computers have been around ever since after the Second World War. I put this date because 1990 is the year when the World Wide Web, as the current dominant protocol of our internet, has been released by a gentleman called Sir Tim Berners-Lee. And I am very proud, I know him. I know him because we were both speakers at the same conference in Beijing before the virus. Now, ICT, the general purpose technology of our time, disrupting our industry, banking, is what we call FinTech. So when you hear this expression, FinTech, financial technology, financial technology revolution, this is the manifestation of ICT as a GPT, general purpose technology, disrupting our industry banking. What is ICT disrupting payments? Paytech. What is ICT disrupting government? GovTech. What is ICT disrupting agriculture? Agritech. What is ICT disrupting education? EduTech. What is ICT disrupting property market? PropTech. What is ICT disrupting? You know, we can go on and on forever, but we have many slides to cover. So let's take a humble look at the galaxy of financial technology. Here I have listed 40 different technologies, 40 different major areas where disruption is going on in front of our eyes within financial services. We can structure these 40 areas into seven major ones. Paytech, for example, CBDCs, Central bank digital currencies, when sovereigns embrace the innovation from cryptocurrencies and make them compliant and roll them out as e euro, e krona, and so on. Mobile wallets. Currently, 57% of adults around the world, 57% of all adults around the world, use one or more mobile wallets. This is especially severe in less banked, underbanked, mostly unbanked environments because mobile wallets are disruptive solutions. Later you will hear more about this. Second category, upper right corner, channel tech. New channels like augmented reality, virtual reality will rise. Ten years down the road, we will be sitting here and you will be praising, and I will be praising, not the mobile banking app of your bank, but the augmented reality application or VR solution of your bank. Category number three. Data tech. Can you remember Chris Skinner? He said, data is like air. Data is the number one input resource of the 21st century, and we are in the third decade of the 21st century, so we better embrace it and win it. We can win it by feeding it into non-linear sigmoid equations ordered into networks, presumably deep 
complex networks. That's what we call deep neural networks. And feeding this data through these deep neural networks and self-propelling it with machine learning algorithms, we are reaching the current cutting edge of deep learning. Or we can put this data on blockchains, and we can create distributed ledger environments. Category number four, land tech, credit tech, peer-to-peer -peer lending, crowdfunding, and the new libling, the new favorite, the new shining star or falling star, BNPL, buy now, pay later. The, the digital reincarnation, the digital reimagination of credit cards. Credit cards for millennials, BNPL. Credit cards for Generation Z, BNPL. Category five is wealth tech, robo-advisors. Betterment and Wealthfront M and the others, they were highly disruptive until social trading, such as eToru, came to the market. Today I will introduce this to you, what social trading is. And then reg tech, regulatory technology is extremely important. We are a compliant industry, luckily, and we are well regulated. Luckily, this is the best interest of us as well as the best interest of the public. Cyber security, privacy tech, trust tech, risk tech, compliance tech, supervisory tech, advanced biometrics, digital identity, and so on. And then, number seven, other areas such as neobanks, challenger banks, new core banking systems, environmental social governance through digital transition in banking. We can go on forever. We are seeing new players on the supply side, S, there is a pointer in it, but the screen is so large that you don't see this tiny little green dot, so I will explain it to you. There are new players on the supply side, S, of the equation. For example, technology giants such as Google, Apple, Facebook, Amazon, Baidu, Alibaba, Tencent, are entering financial services to a certain extent. Chinese technology giants are more risk-taking in this sense. U.S. technology giants are a little bit more reluctant, but what comes late still comes. Demand side, millennials, Generation Z, USA, UK, China, median age of the population, around 40, 40. The barrier between millennials and Generation X. And so now, this year, millennials across major leading economies around the world are taking over the so-called position of peak profitability. What is the position of peak profitability? The generation, the socio-demographic layer of society, which is producing the largest profit volume for corporations, large, well-established companies, including banks. Why is the median age equal in the USA, UK, and China? Why is the population not younger in China? One-child policy. As a proxy, we can put India there, median age 28. New products, mobile wallets, buy now, pay later, robo-advisors. We can go on and on and on. Actually, throughout these two days, we have heard about amazing new products and services. Number four, new channels, augmented reality, virtual reality. The screen is shrinking. Smartwatch already too small. Apple is about to roll out a very serious AR, augmented reality, hardware-software combination.
within months that will stir the water and your banks will start to develop solutions um, uh, through these new channels. New business models. What is a new business model? New structure, new logic of revenues as well as costs. Think about freemium. How many fintech solutions, including mobile wallets, including personal financial management dashboards, including open banking solutions, including digital-only banks, push their services out in a freemium manner? Freemium is not a traditional financial services pricing model. It originates from software industry. Number six, new key input resource. You already know this. Data. Big data. Very big data. Number seven, new technologies, artificial intelligence, blockchain, advanced biometrics, and so on. Number eight, new adoption curve. When I go two sli three slides back, we see that the new adoption curve will actually be exponential, as opposed to the good old linear adoption of financial services, which had paid two years, 200 million users. PayPal, 20 years, 200 million users. That's pretty good as well, but it was earlier than WeChat Pay. Citigroup, we know them very well, 200 years, 200 million active users. I know these numbers because everything is about 220, 200, and 200. You know, easy to remember. But there is a new adoption curve growing in front of our eyes as bank becomes disrupted by ICT deeper and deeper and more and more fundamentally. The adoption curve is becoming more and more exponential technology adoption curve is moving silently but dangerously into financial services. And we have to learn it, embrace it, and win it. Number nine, new market structure. Think about open banking across the European Union. Think about open banking in the UK up and running active since the 1st of January 2018, 300, 300 active registered TPPs, third-party providers in the United Kingdom currently. Account aggregation, AISPs, PISPs, third parties, API ecosystems. We are moving towards new market structures, new risks, there is no free lunch. If there are so many new opportunities, so many new challenges, new risks must also arise. Let's give an example. Cybersecurity. Cybersecurity is unfortunately a rising risk as we are going ahead in more and more fundamental digital transition. And on the right side of the slide, if we have so many new things, if we have so many new dimensions, if we are basically defining a new market of financial services, then we need new strategies, that's why we are here. Strategy fits into a wider picture. Culture, even harder to touch than strategy. Culture eats strategy for breakfast, as Sandra very, very importantly told us on the first day workshop. However, today we will still talk about strategies. Strategies are filled with tactics, and tactical steps are delivered through operative excellence. It's a beautiful structure. Ask CEOs about it. We will today highlight very briefly eight very, very exciting advanced digital banking strategies, okay? Are you ready? 
Number one, the Christensen strategy of disruptive innovation. Clayton Christensen, ex-legendary professor of Harvard Business School, dissected innovation into three, efficiency innovation, sustaining innovation, and disruptive innovation. Clayton Christensen said, in efficiency innovation and sustaining innovation, we, well-established large banks, are better than startups. In disruptive innovation, we are failing. Let's just differentiate these three briefly. Efficiency innovation, cutting costs, for example, robotic process automation, for example, automatically processing your handwritten client documents, cost to income ratio down. You know, you implement an efficiency innovation and, you know, you can uh, produce a, a positive return on investment in weeks sometimes, but maximum within a year. The management loves this, the shareholders love this, and we are beating startups on this turf. Why? Because most startups don't even know their exact cost-to-income ratio or their cost-to-income ratio would be like above one. You know, like they are selling two dollars for one dollar. Anyway, sustaining innovation, step by step, incremental improvement of our existing products and services to serve our existing clientele better, BMW 530, every model year is new. Why? Because if they don't come out with a little bit renewed model, the direct competitors, the other incumbents, Mercedes E-Class, Audi A6, they come out with their new models and they take some of the clients of the other companies. We are good at this our processes of issuing a mortgage loan, our processes of credit card application is becoming step by step better. But when it comes to disruptive innovation, Clayton Christensen explains, large, well-established incumbent, traditional bricks and mortar, successful, highly profitable companies are losing and are losing Miserably, disruptive innovation, when we look at the precise definition, is somewhat counterintuitive. Give yourself time. I will just run through the 10 characteristics of disruptive innovation. Worst product, less good. Think about a mobile wallet versus a top family office or private banking relationship. But at a cheaper price point, cheaper, cheaper, of course, for merchants, for users. If it's less good but cheaper price point, it attracts new to market customers. This is why 54 countries, a continent, it's called Africa, is being disrupted because mobile money is a worse product at a cheaper price point and it attracts new to market customers and 80% of adults were unbanked in Africa when mobile money appeared. Now bankers are waking up. But it's probably too late. Anyway, new business models. Think about low-cost airlines, ultra-low-cost carriers like Wizz Air, EasyJet, Ryanair and the others. Totally different business model. For 50 years in aviation, the business, the margin, the profit driver was business class and first class. Do we have business class and first class in ultra low cost carriers? No, zero class, torturing the people. <laughs> Negative quality, but at a lower price point. And university students, poorer, less affluent people from Central and Eastern Europe, people who never traveled, all of the sudden started to fly around the world 
inclusion. 15 years to disrupt. Many shallow articles say disruption is very sudden. No, it's a process usually. If it's very sudden, it means the market was restricted before. I'm just coming from Ethiopia. I am advising the biggest bank there. 38 million clients. It's a country of 120 million. This bank has been around for 80 years. May 2021, Telebir. What is Telebir? A mobile money solution. What is Bir? The local currency, okay? May 2021. Today, 28 million active users. That's a problem. Do you understand? 80 years, 38 million. 18 months, 28 million. Now the shareholders are trying to talk to the good old CEO of the bank. What were you doing there? Sleeping at the driver's seat or what? But it's not so easy to play defense. Seven years to profit. You have to invest into disruptive things for a long time. Can you remember? Efficiency innovation, quick return on investment. Sustaining innovation, relatively quick return on investment, one or two years. Disruptive innovation, no return on investment in the short run, in the mid run. Okay, simplicity, speed, single focus, self-service, McDonald's, Burger King, small size like Japanese cars are typical. Second step to reposition as a disruptor. Then the incumbents can play defense, uh, but they must avoid the investment trap. What is the investment trap? When you are an incumbent, for example, a traditional bank, and you want to start up a digital-only subsidiary, you have to have and persistently invest into it. How do I know it? I know it because those standalone digital-only companies that reached profitability received persistent 10-digit, 10-digit British pound, US dollar, euro denominated investments before they reached break-even. Starling Bank is my favorite example. Barclays, following the Christensen strategy, top management defines annual innovation budget on top of additional uh, other functional area defined budgets. Cuts it into three. Efficiency innovation, sustaining, disruptive, imposes it on mid-management. Mid-management has to deliver it. Barclays currently 60-35-5. One of my eyes is crying, five, you know, that's not a very good number. The other eye is like smiling, wow, very conscious. Textbook. Boiling frog syndrome, Christensen says incumbents do not recognize typically disruptors. Why? Because the disruptive solution is inferior. Our existing happy, profitable clients, our effluent premium banking clients, I hope I will not bump into this, uh, uh, they don't desperately need another mobile wallet. Therefore, they have a blind spot there. It's like the boiling frog syndrome. You put the frog into boiling water, it luckily jumps out. If you want to boil a frog, don't do it, please. Please don't do it. You have to take lukewarm water, room temperature, put it on the oven, and in 15 years, so, sorry, not 15 years, like disruption, 15 minutes, 15 minutes, you bring it to a boil, and when it's lukewarm in the beginning, you put the frog in, the frog is very happy. The frog is very, very happy. By the time the incumbent frog recognizes that it's subject to disruption. The water is too hot. The muscles are already weak. The balance sheet is leveraged. p and is terrible. Banks want to cut the credit lines, and it's too late to jump. Can you remember typewriters? No? A little bit? Yeah? Okay. Can you remember tapes? 
Can you remember, oh, no, horses, no, we are not that old. Uh, uh, we are much younger than that. Can you remember candles? Okay, no, I don't. Okay, now, let's bring it to a second level. Charles O'Reilly, Michael Tushman. They said, it's not enough to cut the budget. You have to put it into a separate organizational unit. The ability of a firm to survive over time, over cycles of disruption, is its ability to exploit its existing assets and positions in a profit-producing way, and at the same time, simultaneously, to explore new technologies and markets uh, to configure and to reconfigure organizational resources to capture existing as well as new opportunities. What a beautiful sentence. This is the fundamental tension at the heart of an enterprise's long-term survival. Do you get it? Organizations which are serve companies, I, which are surviving major cycles of disruptions, tend to have this ambidextrous or organization structure. What is ambidextrous? Equally skillful with left hand and right hand. I have a squash partner. He's ambidextrous. Don't play with him. He's beating me terrible. You know, he's like changing hands while playing squash, we should ban that. But uh, in management, it's very much legal, allowed, and efficient. Uh, the basic problem confronting an organization is to engage in sufficient exploitation of current positions to ensure its current viability, and at the same time, to devote enough energy to exploration to ensure its future viability. Very beautiful management task. Uh, there are two units, business as usual and emerging business unit. Only the top management connects the two. Each unit has its own functional areas. Okay, I will pick a random area, okay? Like a random financial area, a uh, financial functional area. Today is Thursday. Let's pick compliance, okay? Imagine the compliance people in a well-established trillion dollar total assets, market-leading retail bank. What kind of compliance people you need? Very conservative. We will only do what is explicitly allowed. What kind of compliance people you need in the emerging business unit? People who say, wait a minute, we have to be 100% compliant, but not 200% compliant. 100 is enough. 100.00 is enough. We do what is explicitly allowed, and we ask the regulator about what is not, not allowed. We don't do it. We first ask. And you know, these are different attitudes. For example, research shows, and Empiria shows even more, that sales skills, which are superior in a well-established business, are totally underperforming in an emerging business unit. Live by Emirates NBD, digital bank, totally different target group, different organizational unit. Recently, I gave a training program in Jordan, Jordan is not a very rich country. Jordan is not an overbanked country. So I was so surprised that in Jordan, and it's a limited market, it's not a very big market. In Jordan today, there are three digital only banks. We are not talking about mobile wallets. They have eight mobile wallets. I'm talking about digital only subsidiaries of well-established traditional incumbent banks. Blink by Capital Bank. Link, a bank for youth, by Cairo Amman Bank. And Reflect by Arab Bank. Compare the logo of Reflect and compare the logo of Arab Bank. 
<laughs> very different messages, very different uh, target groups, uh, and so on. USA Today, early days of internet. Uh, the CEO cuts the organization into two, hires a young woman to lead the online journalism unit. The CEO almost gets fired. What are you doing? The traditional journalists asked, what are you doing? Year after year, you are taking the profit of the printed newspaper and you are redistributing some of this profit to those people. They are not even journalists. Let's just call them people. They dress different. They are much younger. They are not cross-checking sources from two independent uh, directions minimum. They are just publishing what they call articles, but they don't even know how to write. 10 years later, 90% of revenue from online journalism unit. Johnson & Johnson, 60% of traditional contact lens market, hard contact lenses, $250 per pair. You can use them for one year, individually made. Soft contact lens market, immature, emerging. CEO cuts the organization into two, almost gets himself fired. 10 years later, Johnson & Johnson owns 60% of the global soft contact lens market. Okay, data ecosystem strategies. Data is, ve no, we are moving fast now, okay? Data is different compared to oil. Why? Because oil is a re linear resource. Oil and gas were the predominant number one input resources of the 20th century industrial capitalism. But we are fortunately or unfortunately, in the 21st century. And the key input resource of the 21st century is data. And data is not linear. Can you remember Metcalf's law, Moore's law? Data is exponential. And that's a different world. Pop-tarts, Walmart. Yes, very unhealthy. Don't eat it. I eat it. No, sorry. Uh, Walmart saves all of their customer transaction data. And they are an 500 billion US dollars revenue per year. And they are analyzing this data according to many, many external data sources. One of the data sources which proved to be gold, gold, oil, air, I am using analogies, you know, data, monetized. One of these external data sources which proved to be very useful is weather data. By analyzing the transactions, they identified a pattern under which the sales of breakfast food pop-tarts surged each time the National Weather Service put out a hurricane forecast, a hurricane warning, okay? Hurricane is coming. People run to Walmart and buy a lot of Pop-Tarts, just in case, okay? Now, what did Walmart do? You know, it's very simple. It's like uh, easy to score the goal from this point. You put the display of Pop-Tarts to the front of your stores when the hurricane warning comes. And you know what happens? The sales of Pop-Tarts goes up even more. Data, data, synergy. One plus one is three. One barrel of oil plus one barrel of oil. It will always remain two barrels of oil. I recently gave a training program to the largest bank in Saudi Arabia. I asked them, and they assured me, yes, David, two barrels of oil are two barrels of oil. Jamie Dimon, probably the best traditional banker. CEO, long time CEO of JP Morgan. When I go to Silicon Valley, they, the fintech startups, all want to eat our dinner. Every single one of them is going to try to eat his dinner, you know. Uh, that's capitalism, and I think that's a good thing. I am extremely happy because Jamie Dimon likes capitalism. Imagine if he hates capitalism and he is the longtime CEO of JP Morgan. It's like terrible feeling. Every day you wake up, another big bank. Oh my God, 2.5 trillion US dollars again. I hate capital. You know, it's much better to love capitalism if you are the CEO of JP Morgan. But what is this behavior about? It's about 
competition. Why? Because he's a winner, JP Morgan is a winner, and the 25,000 currently licensed compliant banks around the world are predominantly winners. However, in a synergetic economy, in an economy where data plus data is more than oil plus oil, a better behavior is co-opetition, to keep competing like banks in Sweden, but also to cooperate at the same time. Swish, Sweden, dominant mobile wallet, taking cash out of circulation de facto, Swish, co-owned by banks, frenemies. Swift, 1974, banks together. R3 currently headquartered in Manhattan, East Coast, not West Coast, like Ripple. 100 major global banks working on the future of SWIFT. The gentleman after me, Christian, he's a great gentleman. He will talk about ISO 2022. Bear with me, now we are connecting the dots for this case. You know, R3, disruptive. ISO 2022, sustaining innovation. Hmm? Now we are categorizing. And you know what? We have to do all. We have to do efficiency, we have to do sustaining, we have to do disruptive. Visa, started up by Bank of America, only became successful when Bank of America opened it up to the competitors. MasterCard started up as an association of banks. Bank ID, Nordic countries, everyone has it. Cooperation between otherwise competing banks. Wise, transfer-wise, eating the cross-border, cross-currency margins of large incumbent banks. But then also cooperating with banks. And the smart banks, including uh, Activo Bank, owned by Millennium BCP. Where is Antonio from Millennium BCP? He talked about that easy busy thing, amazing thing. Uh, uh, anyway, they did a deal with TransferWise to cooperate with the arch competitor in that segment. API platformification, hardcore data ecosystem strategies, front to back, Moven, Brett King, where is Brett King? He told me he has a call at 12.30. Uh, one interface provider, one bank. You know that he's the founder of Moven. Uh, open Banking, UK, Open Banking Association, multiple banks linked to one interface. And then full API platformification, Starling Bank from the UK, plain vanilla, British pound denominated, current account in the center, Everything else, I mean everything else, available th uh, uh, through selected partners, through basically an app store. Okay, strategy number seven, social platformification. You connect users with users. Venmo started up in 2021. Every payment is public. Recently there was a scandal in the USA. They caught good old, sorry, not politically, good old Joe Biden on uh, Venmo. What was the guy doing on Venmo? He was transferring money to his grandchildren. Why? Because his grandchildren are smart. They figured out that he has more money than they have, currently at least. And then they asked the grandfather to send them some money. But how can he send some money? Through Venmo, because that's what they are using. Social, you can comment, you can see, and so on. Five minutes? Very good, better than minus five. Very good, because they are showing me how much time I have. Uh, but then, you know, it's totally crazy. 50 years of finance, even more than 50, ever since the Second World War, 70 years, has been all about strict fundamental subjective and objective privacy. And then comes this story that you see each other's payments. And then goes 85 million people there and transacts 240 billion in 2021 and around 300 billion in 2022. Itoru, social trading, stock trading, index trading, currency trading, commodity trading, uh, 
<laughs> but everyone sees my trades. I am there with my own name, with my own profile. I have a risk score, six. One is like very conservative, 10 is very much leverage, speculative, and so on. And then everyone sees my trading results. And it's like social media for stock trading. And guess what? There are now 27 million young people in 100 countries using it, growing exponentially. And you know what happens when you see someone who has a smart narrative, nice face, no, no, that's not, the face doesn't matter, good trading results, uh, low risk score, you follow the person, and then you can even copy. What is copying? You allocate some of your money to automatically mimic the trades of that person. When you have copiers, you receive asset management fee. Recently, Goldman Sachs, UBS, Credit Suisse, and the others, BlackRock, started to hire talent from eToro. Because that's where the de facto new, young, talented, global, international asset managers are hanging out. And you know what? Then they did an advertisement with Alec Baldwin. I don't approve that. <laughs> Not a very good choice, probably. Uh, anyway, there are controversial things. Uh, there is nothing perfect. Every coin has uh, two uh, sides. Uh, but you know what? The most popular copy trader in the world is a young woman, and her original profession is to train horses. She is not coming from a big brokerage, but what she does, she can explain in a way that simple people, everyone, I, you, other people can understand. Self-platformification. Can you remember Starling Bank? Plain vanilla? Current account, one denomination, one market, not like Revolut, everything everywhere, and then I need the other one billion funding. No, and where is my safeguarding account? I forgot it. Uh, sorry. Uh, and then, uh, 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 so, 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 super, starting in the middle with outside partners. But what if instead of those external partners, you, yourself become your own external partner. It's like playing chess, strategy. And then vitality from South Africa, connecting insurance, banking, daily life, health, and creating synergy from all this data. Where are we? Look, we have three slides, you see, and we will be extremely fast. So you exercise 20 minutes per day, and Vitality knows about this. You know how? Because your Vitality app is installed on your smartwatch. But then you get the newest smartwatch for free. And all of this is connected with financial data, driving data. It turns out that people don't cheat. 99.2% of people are truthful. They don't cheat the apps in order to get the benefits. But you know what the internal audit showed? Statistically speaking, this is only statistics, the richer the users are, the more chance there is they cheat for a little benefit. Very sad statistics. Uh, don't re read fairy tales, don't read uh, 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 internal uh, analytics. Uh, 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 but even in fairy uh, Anyway, so uh, uh, what is happening? They created a digital ecosystem with serious synergies around themselves, just like DBS Bank, led by Piyush Gupta, an undisputed genius. I know the prior CEO, he's my friend, but even he admits that Piyush Gupta is a genius, so we can admit. And he not only built a digital bank, he built an ecosystem around it. He built the entire real estate, renting, buy, sell marketplace around the bank. He built the new and used car online dealership app around it. He built a, an airplane ticketing 
hotel agency around the bank. You see, he built it himself. This is self platformification. Very hard. Anyway, thank you for your very kind attention. We talked through eight strategies. There are 18 more, and you, as CEOs, you don't copy these strategies. You use them as ingredients. You combine them. You recombine them. You reimagine them. You extend them. You adopt them and then you implement them. But when you implement these strategies, you will have to know a lot about Agile. That's why later we will have an amazing panel discussion about Agile transition. We are living the age of banking renaissance. That's why we are here. Strategize it and win it. Thank you for your attention. We will win this time back somehow. Yeah. Thank you.